Hi, everyone. This is the official Succession podcast from HBO and Pineapple Street Studios. I'm Kara Swisher. Find out what this fuck is planning. I don't need him in my teeth right now. We're losing the momentum. Can we get a raid? Am I getting demoted right now? In the middle of an investigation? No. Logan, they are coming up. And if you don't open the door, they will kick it in. This week on Succession, Waystar goes into panic damage control mode and Kendall tries to transform himself into a woke warrior. Fuck the patriarchy! It didn't really work out that well. Meanwhile, the other Roy siblings are doing damage control for their dad. Can they help keep this scandal from sending the company into a total tailspin? You should all be out there. Call them out on this. The Roy family's brand of damage control is one thing I'll be talking about with my guest, Lucy Preble. Lucy is an executive producer and writer on Succession. She also wrote the Tony-nominated show Enron. It's about the financial scandal that cratered the Texas Energy Company. Someone can be utterly sincere in their own mind at the same time as being, from the outside, really ridiculous. Suffice it to say, she's well-versed in corporate scandals. But first, power rankings. Things start off horribly for Kendall this week, so bad he doesn't even notice there's a problem. His disingenuous attempts to come off as hip and progressive wind up as fodder for late night television. I feel like I should go on. Thank you. What do you think? I think we should talk to Mary because there's a couple ways to counter backlash and it might not be the best. Backlash? This is being in the conversation. Yeah. This is fucking great. He agrees to go on the show I do not know why, then bails, and things feel like they couldn't get any worse. But then he's saved by some even bigger news. The FBI is downstairs. Tell them to fuck off. Yeah, these are the ones who don't fuck off. And that's exactly why, in the end, Kendall is up and Logan is down. What do we say? Cooperate. Open up. Let them in. It's a rare defeat for Logan, and the raid could have implications for pretty much everyone in the Roy family. By the way, also down, Greg. By the cost of one very expensive watch. You want to transfer now? Um, it's 40K. Oh, no, no, um, I think th- this is a, like a gift situation. And the biggest power move this week goes to Tom. Tom offers to fall on his sword for Logan, and that could boost his standing. I'm probably in the firing line, and I just wanted you to know, if you need to strategize, I can be that guy. I'll, I'll step up and go down. But want to know what I really think? Shiv should get credit for this move. She convinced Tom that his performative sacrifice was a good idea, and she might not mind a little break from Tom anyway. You know, it's very likely that no one goes to prison. Uh Either way, you bank gold with my dad. The offer is kind of genius. And those are the power rankings for now. Listen, I want you guys to hit me. Yes. Just rickles the fuck out of Oedipussy here. I want to start with an early scene from this episode. The Waystar Royco leadership is doing damage control. The communications team is trying to spin the narrative. The Roy family is presented with a new tagline. In terms of getting proactive, Hugo had Franklin's put together some full page responses. The tagline, we get it. I thought it was quite funky. We get it. A bit like those ladies on the cruise ship got it. Jerry liked it. Yeah, it's a little, ah, yeah, we get it already. Stop moaning about the rigs. But what can a full-page ad in the New York Times really do when the FBI is raiding your office? That's kind of what Shiv and Roman are saying, right? Anyway, it's an inept attempt to fend off total collapse, and it happens to plenty of real-life companies. My guest today is Lucy Preble. She wrote a play about that failure. It's called Enron. It debuted in the UK in 2009 and then on Broadway in 2010. Lucy is also an executive producer and writer on Succession. Lucy, welcome to the show. Hi, thanks for having me. No problem. I want to get to Enron in a second because it's a fantastic show. Uh, can we talk about that, uh, that scene a bit with the awkward PR slogan? I feel like I've been on the receiving end of that as a reporter so many times. Really? Um, yeah, it's, uh, I remember as you just played it, I remember us coming up with it in the writer's room, trying to think of um, phrases that would work. And it was very much, when we were talking about it, it was very much in the heat of the Me Too movement. And so that was very alive at the time. 
And of course, when you're writing in a writer's room, you know, one of us said, we get it and said, that's, that's actually a really good tagline. And then somebody else, you know, basically made the comment that Roman makes, which is, well, it's a bit this, isn't it? And then someone else made the comment that Shiv makes, which is, but you could also see it like that. And, and, and it's through those kind of conversations that you end up, you know, writing the script. That's how it works. What are the alternates you tried out? Oh gosh, I don't remember. Um, I remember that being, it, it, it came out of nowhere. And then it was through mm -hmm. someone saying, we get it, that someone else in the room said, oh, maybe we should have a story where they're trying, where they have a tagline. So it was actually the other way around. We weren't, we weren't planning to have a, have some sort of like PR position that was encapsulated in a sentence. And then we had to pitch for it. It, it, it came the other way around. Um, so yeah, yeah, there, I don't think there were any other alternatives. When you, when you think about these people that are doing these sort of PR slogans, companies especially trying to humanize themselves, uh, Enron did quite a bit of it too. They, they were very aggressive in their PR. How do you look at, at that concept of like trying to convince people by taking these full page ads and everything else, which does happen in almost every crisis, uh, corporate crisis thing I've ever covered? Yeah, I mean, I actually think it's becoming more sinister. Um, I long for the days where it was full page ads, you know, and it was sort of clear who was saying what. Now I feel like companies are embodied often by a sort of 22 year old intern on a social media mm -hmm. account <laughs> who is interacting with people in a sort of ironic way about a scandal that's just happened. Right. And that's very confusing um, and, and yeah, and unclear. And yeah, um, I think something confusing that happens is that companies tend to adopt somehow their CEO's moral position. And that happens very subtly, but it happens pervasively over time. And so you can find that the nature of the CEO will be present in the behavior of the company at moments of crisis. And that, that tends to remain true. Well, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention Facebook's recent response to the whistleblower, which was very aggressive. And the PR people were super aggressive about her, Frances Haugen. Um, to saying she was a nobody, she wasn't in the room, she didn't know what she was talking about, and then that was followed by Mark Zuckerberg saying a nicer version of that. It didn't work, actually. People thought, what's wrong with you people? Yeah, it's surprising. I mean, yes, but but the description of it not working is, I mean, t to in what way? They're still the most powerful company in the world in, in, in that's some true. ways, um, and it's still run by Mark Zuckerberg. I mean, that's one of the things we discussed as to whether or not Waystar should cooperate and whether or not Logan's attitude to cooperation would be. So Zuckerberg, we know, is intellectually brittle, and the response follows exactly that mold, which is Facebook is a good thing. How dare you? I would say is probably the three-word slogan I would attach to Facebook in terms of their response to... Um, to scandal how dare you right and so when you're in the writer's room how much does real life events like this intercede into it it gives us a lot of material it gives us a lot of conversation um mm -hmm. we, we tend to have two approaches one will be we will discuss things that are happening in real time you know we'll come in and go did you see this did you see that but one other approach that we have is one person in the room often gets nominated to go away and read or research a particular book or a particular topic. Um, there have been some, you know, some books, some memoirs of very powerful business people, but also accounts of, of things. Um, what, you know, I, I'd already done that when I arrived in the room about Enron. So I had that from the play that I'd written. But there's, yeah, each writer is often given a book to go away, read and come back and report on what was most interesting or sort of potentially dramatic material for us from that book. So those are the two ways that that really happens. But yeah, we, we're we also deeply committed to rarely doing anything in the show that we can't find an example of somewhere happening. Because ah, Jesse's Jesse really, really doesn't like it getting into sort of soap opera or operatic or fantasy places um the point of the show is that it's very very grounded and part of that is to just look for comparisons all of the time and just make sure that we're not doing anything that feels convenient from a dramatic perspective all right lucy you talked about how jesse armstrong really wants the show rooted in reality that's not a soap opera or fantasy what are some examples of how you leaned into the reality of it all in this episode I think in episode three, we were keen to have meet the sort of crisis meetings that happen around stuff like this and for people to not really be sure what to do or what to think. 
and that they don't really know where they stand. So just to make sure that those crisis meetings actually felt weirdly undramatic, I suppose, because I think that's the reality of those things. People aren't sort of, you know, arguing their point in a beautifully articulate Sorkin-esque way. In the reality of these moments, people are sort of going along with what's being suggested, shrugging and making fun of it. And that's the reality of how these things go. So that's, that's definitely something we tried to achieve in those crisis meetings. Um, so before joining the writers room, you mentioned on succession, you've worked mostly in theater. Um, a lot of this, uh, show does feel like a play. Um, are you thinking about that as you as a writer yourself or in the writer's room? Funnily enough, I was more aware of it this series than any of the other seasons. I, I felt that some scenes went on a little long and we, we, we've worked on that in the edit, but yeah, for the first time ever, I wondered about that. The The show certainly has probably longer scenes than you're used to seeing on television. Um, you're used to people sort of cutting out earlier than we do. And so sometimes it's hard to tell if you're just driven to want to do that because it's what you're used to. Because one of the things that's really interesting is when you stay in a scene longer than you normally would, actually different stuff starts to happen in the writing and in the performances of the actors that can be really valuable and particularly really funny. You find a lot of comedy happens after the plot beat has happened. And so that's good about, yeah, staying in the scene a little bit longer. There's there's a lot of uncomfortable moments that last a little longer. When, when Jerry comes in at one point and they ignore her, you know, they just, it's a little too long, the whole, and it's not a little too long, it's what would happen in life. Yeah, and that's sort of what we're aiming for. But of course, you have to balance that with being an entertaining television show and try yeah, and keep right, an eye on right. it, absolutely. Um, but yeah, in theatrical terms as well, I'm often the person pitching about sort of tragic arcs. So sometimes when we're talking early on about the arc of the series as a whole, um, I'll say something in the writer's room like, well, look, if we were just doing a tragedy, this is what would happen. Um, and, that, and, that, and that'll be a pitch that I'll give just to sort of like explore it. Um, and we often do that. Sometimes we'll do something like the you know, sitcom pitch would be da, da 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 and then we'll say that this is what would happen in a sitcom or sometimes something else entirely like I sometimes also say well the trashy soapy pitch would be this and sometimes what you're doing is pitching an idea almost to encourage everyone to imagine the opposite of it you know you're not always pitching to try and say this is what we should do sometimes you're just like looking ahead narratively what if we did it this way yeah what if we, did it what if we yeah and and provoking other people to go oh, god no that's a totally unsuccession thing to do Right, unsuccession. Is there? Is that a? Is that a? Uh, yeah, a yeah, yeah. This is yeah. The succession way of doing that would be this, or, or that's 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 not very succession-y Is a phrase we use. What what is something unsuccession? I like that word. So something unsuccession would be um, like there's a like there's very clear consequences to a character's actions where they end up either being rewarded or punished in a very clear way for something they decided to do. Um, yeah, that would be very unsuccession because the show really excels in the gray areas and in the feeling that although there's something very satisfying about what happens, it's not always predictable in the sense of television predictable, I mean. I, and in that way, as you said earlier, we're trying to be more like life where, where for quite a few years now, in any way, in terms of my experience, consequences have felt quite random and arbitrary. Um, and they happen to some people and not to others. Yeah, or not at all. Oh, not or at there all. aren't any consequences. Yeah. Or they don't think about consequences of things. Mm. Um, your play Enron was about the real life corporate uh, scandal of that energy company. Um, I, one thing you said in it, um, in an interview you did with the New York Times was, I feel uncomfortable about the fact that intelligence isn't always related to goodness at all. Um, can you talk a little bit about things? I thought that was a very... I thought that was a very profound sentence to say, and I agree with it. I just was having an argument on Twitter about Peter Thiel, and someone said, I can't believe you like him. I said, I don't like him. He's very smart. Yeah. I, I disagree with him almost on everything. Yeah, that's really interesting. I, yeah, I was exploring something of that in Enron. Um, the way that I chose to write Jeffrey Skilling, the CEO, was how he was described by a lot of people who knew him, which was always the smartest guy in the room. But I think that that is a double-edged sword, that, that compliment stroke criticism, because also when you say that about somebody, you're sort of saying he was an arrogant son of a bitch, which is also how other people would describe them. Like in his own mind, he's always the smartest guy in the room. And both those, and those things often come together. 
And it's interesting to think about Zuckerberg, we were talking about earlier as well in that, which is, I think, I think a kind of visionary intelligence that we associate with genius is also dangerously associated with a lack of compassion and a brittleness that particularly in powerful men anyway uh, i think you see you're saying lack of empathy yeah lack of empathy a belief in their vision above everything else and also in in one thing people used to always say about jeffrey skilling was that he didn't really understand why anyone would ever behave irrationally so his visions and his business models were always based on the idea that people would do what was best for them and profitable and that, that and it would all work with everyone behaves logically and it's that's really really untrue and it's a really dangerous idea when you're like basing huge business models and levels of debt on the rational behavior of human beings yeah i think there was something i was trying to explore in that with that character about how that yeah men particularly um but not just men but people with that sort of intelligence that does feel visionary and new are considered geniuses in a way that gives them a lot of power in our society. And as I was saying, I don't think there's any relationship at all. In fact, if there is a relationship, I think it may be inverse between goodness and what we consider um, to be moral goodness anyway, and that kind of cerebral um, smartness or cleverness. What does the succession feel like a tragedy to you? If it's not, what is it? Yeah, I... I struggle to pigeonhole it. To me, it feels it feels like a tragedy in the sense that I think very hard about the tragedy in it. But but when I watch it, it feels like a comedy. Um, it's also got a, a big dollop of sitcom. A lot of the writers come from the world of sitcom. The episodes are often very situational. They often have quite a bordered idea, which um, isn't always the case in drama often often it doesn't have that and I think that's what draws a lot of people to it is you're quite excited about what's going to happen and where they're going to be in the next episode it doesn't just feel like a sort of film cut into eight pieces as it were Mm -hmm. yeah so when you think about tragedy you have the archetypes and we do power rankings obviously here but do the the Roy family members fill those archetypal roles do you think I'm sure somebody who specializes could make an argument as to how they do for me, honestly, there's only one character in Succession who I feel like has that, and that's Logan. I mm-hmm. think that everybody else is an inversion or a sort of parody or a... They feel more like fleshed out real people to me. Um, whereas Logan is archetypal, and part of that is that he's... I suppose the show invests him with a real sense of power. And I, I, and that's interesting. Everybody else, I think, has an element of comic cowardice or false power to them. But it does. But the show does invest Logan with a real sense of power. And sometimes that's tricky and problematic because sometimes you think, oh, those people are equally sort of um, fake and flawed and cowardly. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But Logan, yeah, like, you're never quite sure what Logan's thinking. And of them all, he he has terrible qualities, but he isn't a coward. And I think that makes him unique and more archetypal. When you joined the writing staff in Succession, how did Jesse Armstrong define the different family members? Were they were they each representative of something, or is it just a family? Oh um, no, yeah. Because everyone in a family is representative in ev- in everyday families. Sure, I think no. I, I certainly it was never articulated that way at all. Um, Jesse came with a very strong sense of who they were in. In, yeah, in, in a familial way, also in a comic way. I always, he, this was never articulated. I just always felt like, yeah, t- Tom is a really interesting combination of um, sort of obsequious, like, um, suck up and bully. And that's really interesting. And in that friction is a very interesting character in a comic conceit, I suppose. But yeah, I don't know. Je- Jesse certainly never defined them. They're not, not like chess pieces to be moved around and to be defined in a certain way at all. 
Um, I think it, yeah, I think it just came out of family dynamics and possibly just doing a lot of research into those sorts of dynastic families, both con contemporary ones, but also classically. Um, we, we, I remember we brought a historian in called Tom Holland, who specializes in ancient Rome, who gave us a session just talking about the sort of dynasties and powerful families of ancient Rome and, so, and that sort of stuff, you know, is, is fascinating as well and feeds into it. Speaking of, of, of family dynamics, in the episode, there's a fancy journalism dinner, the Committee to, for the Protection and Welfare of Journalists. Shiv goes to neutralize Kendall as a featured speaker. And that dynamic between the brother and the sister, I'd love to talk about that. And then next, the, the, the dynamic between Shiv and uh, uh, her old flame and colleague, Nate. I think, it was, I think it was nice to see Nate return in terms of, you know, these circles of people do run into each other constantly. It's very believable. And then her, yeah, her conversation with Kendall, where really what I'm fascinated in is when people make a strong argument that's both sincere and insincere at the same time. So she makes a play uh, to convince Kendall that really change only occurs from the inside in from a company, within. from within, which yeah. is a really interesting argument. It's one that we had in the room and people people tend to be personality types that lean one way or the other um, in terms of how they think change happens. We all need for us to win the shareholder vote, you too. So just, you know, just wait a week. I'm not a suicide bomber, Shiv. Hey, I wanted to say, um, I think I'm right. I, I am right, but I maybe threw a couple of ugly rocks. I'm just trying to be more thoughtful now. So. Look, I, I think we have the same aim here, is the truth. Like, is there a world where you stop being gross and throwing stones? and we can acknowledge and rebuild you know, truth and reconciliation. So it's just very interesting when someone like Shiv kind of is saying that, and there's probably part of her that believes that. So she's one of those people who's a good liar because in George Costanza way, she can, it's not a lie if you believe it. In the moment when you say it, <laughs> it sounds convincing mm -hmm. to you. But then very, very quickly, she can immediately drop out of it. And you see her face change as she realizes Kendall completely is calling her on her um, manipulative nonsense. And then suddenly she doesn't believe that at all. Well, she, or if she ever did. You're right. I think one of the most interesting things is how people lie to themselves. Mm. And that in that moment, she's certainly lying to herself. She's joining a, a group of people who are very conservative and she wasn't. Or pre, she's changed herself and transformed herself yeah. to suit them. Absolutely. And... As you say, people do that all of the time. They, 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 they lie to themselves or they evolve their opinions and morality to suit their circumstances better. And in fact, people do that more often than the other way around. What's that famous saying about it's very hard to get a man to believe something when his paycheck depends on him not believing it. Um, it's, it's terrifying the extent to which we do that. And the characters in Succession do that a lot. I mean, you can see that with Kendall as well, that this whole season is, is about him staking a moral claim and having principles but that probably come out of his first abundant need to destroy his father and the morality around it is incidental so in this episode speaking of kendall we see the company doing damage control for its public and but so is kendall um tell us about how the writers talked about kendall's pr offensive because it was painfully awkward yeah are you are you talking about the interview or the limo yes every all every bit every time he does it all of it that's something that just came about in the writing really of course we did of course we did sort of talk about it but we talked about it in 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 in, in terms of scenes we never sat and said here is a kendall's pr offensive will go terribly um it's never quite as articulated as that i think there's just an understanding that with who kendall is there's just, there's no way it could be any different. The, the one conversation we, I remember having was, I remember saying to, to Jesse at one point, how sincere should he be at the, you know, in, in the first few episodes? And I think what the conclusion that we came to was someone can be utterly sincere in their own mind at the same time as being on, from the outside really ridiculous. And in fact, they're more likely to be ridiculous the more sincere that they are. So it's sort of trying to find that balance. Watching the reactions of people around him, you do see that. They're like, yeah. he says he's great. And they're all like, huh. <laughs> Yeah. Sure. And you don't want to push that too far, though, because there are points sometimes where I think, well, you know, 
it's more interesting i think if there are moments where you painfully relate to kendall even if they're small moments not throughout necessarily but where you you sort of go oh i could quite easily say something like that something as as clumsy and politically apparently aware let's go to a clip on that uh, another scene this is kendall and his cohort in the limousine reading tweets about himself which many people do uh i want to play a clip and then talk about him and this scene Okay. He clearly has mental health issues and right. crazy guilt coupled with addiction. That's all this is, and it's sad. Yeah, that one did suck, but it was truthful. Um, so talk about uh, this good tweet, bad treat, and the, uh, a tone that was difficult to hit because he's both aware and completely unaware of himself at the same time. Yeah, good tweet, bad tweet. It's, it's the idea, as you say, that somebody is able to laugh at themselves is sort of, it's sort of Kendall's saving grace in a way that he takes himself incredibly seriously but also has this element of being able to see the joke as well and that comes yes in the writing but it comes a lot from jeremy's performance as well i think mm -hmm. it's jeremy strong who plays kendall yeah um and maybe it's something that was noticed early on and then was explored and and grew out of it because i think if he wasn't if he didn't have that he'd be a much thinner character um and what it is is that's that's inherent in good tweet bad tweet like he's not you know the the easy comic thin version would be someone who just wants to hear the good tweets about themselves but he doesn't he also wants to hear the bad ones partly because he's masochistic which is obvious throughout i think the whole show yes but it's not just that it's also i want to be seen to be able to laugh at myself he understands what's funny and likable that's almost like kendall's tragedy and he's always reaching for it. He just never can quite do it. There's a scene, there's a line he has in season one where he's talking to Roman. He says, why doesn't anyone think I'm funny? I'm funny. Um, and I just think, yeah, I just think that encapsulates that character really well. Yeah, so when he was doing Fuck the Patriarchy, he's always looking for a moment of attention, which I think is really very, quite sad. And he, and, and he doesn't realize quite how... He, it glimpsed, you have glimpses of him knowing what people actually think of him. Yeah, there's a there's a really cringe-worthy scene where he goes to talk to the writers on the late night show. Yes. Uh, yeah. In this episode. And actually the head writer is played by one of our writers, Will Tracy, which is amusing to, to watch. And Will gives oh. a really good performance because Will used to write for, I think, Saturday Night Live or maybe John Oliver used to write. He used to maybe, maybe both. But... Um, Yes, he, so he knows that, he knew that world very well. And yeah, Kendall sort of comes in and basically tries to persuade them to be rougher on him. And to, you know, again, it's this very sort of masochistic urge that maybe people will like him if he um, shows them his belly. And, I, and, and yet it's sort of unbearable. But so satirical elements really do play here a lot in, in season three compared to season one and two. Was that a conscious choice by the team? No, I don't think so. I do remember commenting on it. There's one episode in particular later in the season, which obviously we won't go into now for spoilers, but where where I think it hits high, it, it does really go for satire. Um, and, I, and, I, and I hope it's successful in it. Um, but yeah, no, not consciously. I don't love the idea that it, it, that it would become very self-conscious or, or satirical because I think that the show works as a drama and then and as hour longs because it has more of a beating heart and also that characters behave in a way that human beings behave and are quite flawed and loose and not ciphers for a particular point of view um and sometimes satire can do that it can just be right. pieces to move around so yeah i hope we stay on the right side of that so one of the things that I also notice is that it, it feels very, how small the show feels. They're in rooms. They're, it's very claustrophobic this, this season. It feels very claustrophobic. It does, and yeah. They're all, they're all on their phones and they're all by themselves and they're, it looks uncomfortable despite the beautiful circumstances of some of their apartments. None of them look comfortable in any place they are, except maybe 
Logan's uh, library, perhaps, where the chairs seem comfortable. But it's very tight. Um, was that an idea? Because it's much more so cold, isolated, uh, maybe to reflect them. Also. Yeah, that's yeah, that's interesting that you noticed that. I, I think, it, again, that's not fully conscious, as in it's not articulated at the beginning of the process. But it's something that happens over time, partly because... Um, we wanted jesse was very keen for the first episode and the second episode to be a scramble like it's very much a scramble to react to this thing that they didn't think was going to happen and it's all about being in transit and in transit necessarily people are enclosed in spaces there's like in episode one there's so much going from like a car to a van to a limo to a plane to a and that's where all the decisions are made and one thing i love about the show and this comes very much from jesse's taste is exactly that he has a real eye for the reality of a location and a lot of showrunners don't think about that most television that you watch is chosen on the basis of how easy is the place to film in so most television that you watch people live in really quite large spacious houses in a way that i think creatively has an impact because eventually over time people start thinking why do i live in this little shitty house when everyone on television seems to have bigger houses and it's purely because they want to be able to fit all the cameras in nicely so normally choices like that come out of a practicality that has a very subtle but pervasive effect over the whole course of art and jesse is passionate about choosing um locations that feel real and truthful and aware something would actually happen and then we have to make it work to shoot in that space he loves kind of ugly like empty difficult rooms he loves stuff that, yeah um yeah stuff you never normally see on television um but spaces where most people spend most of their time or i don't mean like I'm, i know we're talking about the super rich but we're also we're also talking about people being as i said you know in cars getting in and out of vans waiting for something it's it's fair the texture of it is ugly which it's we fair. love it's captivity it feels like captivity there's also how things change people um you know, you 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 you've written about it in real life with Enrons. How do how do corporate scandals affect people? Some people are very energized for them because they like the reactiveness of things. You know, because everything's a re what should we do now? What about this? What about this? And it's never thoughtful. Yeah, um, a lot of it is reactive. Um, some people thrive, some people don't. Um, can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, I I think we made a choice with Logan that he was going to be energized. Um, by this and he is you know there, there, there's it starts in episode one of the he has the shock and the recoil but then he as he says he goes you know wants to go full fucking beast he he's very very energized and you actually see i think a side of logan you haven't quite seen in the, in the following episodes in two and three the, the episode that we're discussing where where he has a kind of bullish energy where it allows you to imagine what he was like as a younger man and I think that's great in terms of Brian's performance. It's also hopefully in the writing. Um, yeah, and, and, but I think I, I would be absolutely exhausted by something like this. Like my, uh, it's my nightmare having to deal with a scandal like this. I would be totally overwhelmed. But I think there's something about the character of people who become, well, who are like self-made CEOs anyway, who aren't appointed, you know, self-made like Logan is who have always dealt with adversity by sort of roaring at it. And that's part of the story they tell about themselves. And so there is that, that immediate emotional response. There's a psychological response, which is that when somebody attacks them, because they've had, they feel like they've had to do that their whole lives. Right. I've always been right. Mm. I'm going to push through. I'm going to do it my way. Yeah. You know, and again, and going back to what we were saying earlier, a sense of how dare you, you know, I, I will, I will destroy you, all of that. And I think, and I think for people who don't have that, who, who don't thrive in reactivity and find it in, you know, find that sort of thing incredibly overwhelming, that's difficult to understand, but it definitely exists. And those people have a really unfair advantage in life at that point anyway. Because if you're prepared to be very, very surprisingly aggressive about something like that, it really freaks people out. <laughs> it really destabilizes them. And you become quite powerful in the room. What do you, what do you think drives these three children, the Roy children? Well, obviously, obviously, fundamentally, they're driven by a need to want to seek out their father's love. I mean, I think that's clear from the nature of the show. But I think they're also all different in terms of the, the thing that drives them 
specifically and i i can't i i don't think i can just pinpoint it into one word for for each of them um yeah, I, I, I can't, but I, but I do think it's subtly different for each of them. But it has, it has something to do with that old um, saying about if you can't have love, the next best thing is power, and and that that and I think Jeremy was talking about that in an interview recently. That I think that's you know that's an astute observation that people who have love withheld from them can be driven just to just to have power, just to feel safe. Because actually, when you are powerful, you are more safe. Is, is there any character, though, that you think you would be if you had to pick one? I have a soft spot for Shiv and writing, and writing Shiv, particularly in this season, because I was really interested in looking at the way in which, because she's a woman, she's used by the company, and the way in which her being a woman at the centre of this scandal gives her power, and also... In, massively disempowers her at the same time and I felt I was very interested in that and had a lot to sort of contribute around that all right excellent thank you so much Lucy for sharing all this it's fascinating Lucy Preble is the executive producer and writer on Succession her most recent play is called A Very Expensive Poison she's also the co-creator of the show I Hate Susie which is available on HBO Max tell the fuck off This is the official podcast of HBO series Succession, and it's a production of HBO and Pineapple Street Studio. It's hosted by Kara Swisher. Our executive producers are Gabrielle Lewis, Barry Finkel, Max Linsky, and Jenna Weiss-Bourbon. Our senior producer of the show is Nick White, and Darby Maloney is our editor. This episode was produced by Michael Catano and me, Shaka Mali, and engineered by Michael Catano. Production music is courtesy of HBO. You can listen to the next episode of HBO Succession Podcast after watching episode four of Succession on Sunday, November 7th on HBO Max. And don't forget to subscribe to The New Conversation every week, wherever you get your podcasts.